practice workup and its relevance in modern diagnostic armamentariums. So uh, this case is aimed at uh, the uh, basic clinical setup in ophthalmology where the, uh, the clinician wants to practice uveitis and at the same time uh, a setup where uh, uh, like new there are so many new college new aims like medical institutions are opening up in india and many of my colleagues are setting up departments there so it is relevant from their point of view uh, i'll be starting with the basic practice of uveitis in a clinical setup is it feasible in an institution like new aims or uh, or a new setup uh, uh, then dr nitin kumar dr anirudh dr swapnil uh, will be discussing different aspects of uh, uveitis workup and management of different entities. Uh, Dr. Brutendu, uh, due to some um, unavoidable reason, could not be with us today. So Dr. Nitin will be uh, discussing his topic. And in the end, we will have experts' view on the need for elaborate laboratory tests and molecular diagnostic assays by Dr. Padma Malini. So what is the meaning of a basic clinical setup? So basic clinical setup entails a slit lamp, of course, with anterior segment photography, indirect ophthalmoscopy, fluorescein angiography with or without ICG, and OCT for sure with or without an OCT angiography. Basic microbiology is usually present in any uh, clinical setup, even in a small private setup. Uh, radiology, newer aims have good diagnostic and interventional radiology, so that can be of help. Uh, ultrasound B-scan with ultrasound biomicroscopy is again easily available and of course good clinical skills and referral from your colleagues. Slit lamp examination and indirect ophthalmoscopy is the beginning of the uh, uh, uveitis case workup where the uh, detailed examination of cornea, the characterization of KPs, whether they are mutton fat, stellate, pigmented, give away a lot about the diagnosis. Cells and flare, the sun grading classification, it uh, still forms the gold standard in a uveitis workup. Angle examination using gonioscopy and fundus periphery with indentation gives you a detailed uh, view of the posterior segment pathologies. We often start with chest x-ray and MONTO and these are still relevant in today's times because India is endemic to tuberculosis and tubercular uveitis is very very common in our practice. Uh, tubercular cause is also a great masquerader and presents as any form of uveitis. Chest x-ray is routinely done as a screening tool before starting high dose corticosteroids or committing to immunosuppression and often ordered before CCT or HRCT as a screening since it's a lower radiation uh, test. MONTO again identifies latent tuberculosis, good correlation with uveitic uh, process, universally performed with or without IGRA and continues to be widely ordered and holds value in endemic regions. Uveitis and its complications are even more common in developing countries uh, when compared to Western population and occurs in up to 714 per 100,000 population and accounts for about 25% or 25 of all blindness. So developing countries often see a larger proportion of infectious causes of uveitis and most of these etiologies can be diagnosed clinically using standard microbiology. So I'm insisting on this is because it is important to at least uh, uh, practice uvea even in a basic setup because the diagnosis and management requires a very basic setup which I'll be elaborating in the cases that I show in the next slides. Commonly seen uh, infectious uveitis in India are toxo, tuberculosis in different forms, and viral uveitis. The non-infectious, this list is quite long, but these are commonly seen entities, which I'm sure all of us have seen in our clinical practice and managed. I'll just show a few cases to uh, show you that I uh, am working in a very basic setup. Still, I am able to manage 90 to 95 percent of uveitis cases, and how. Uh, it is important to not straight away refer to them in the uh, because of lack of equipment. You should attempt to diagnose them clinically and manage them in, and, and you are able to do that successfully in the majority of cases. So this is a straightforward case of young patient with acute uh, course of disease with hypopion uh, diagnosed as acute anterior uveitis, intermittent low backache and uh, HLA-B27 came out positive 
was treated with uh, topical steroids and uh, we we see this is one of the commoner forms of anterior uveitis that we see in our practice does not require any uh, elaborate investigations does not require any elaborate imaging techniques and uh, the outcome is really good in these cases with good counseling and follow up uh, this is another case where this is a middle aged lady with uh, granulomatous capes uh, cataract and uh, this is actually a case of chronic uveitis with uh, acute exacerbation patient was uh, negative for tuberculous workup chest x-ray showed hilar lymphadenopathy the patient was diagnosed as having sarcoidosis and on treatment the patient is doing fine planned for cataract surgery so a simple uh, ruling out of uh, tubercular etiology chest x-ray and the characterization of kps in this case can help us diagnose and manage this case nicely this is another case where a middle aged male with diminution of bilateral diminution of vision uh, came with this picture and on uh, sus suspecting the uh, systemic association because of these skin lesions this patient was referred to dermatology and came out uh, uh, ca came as uh, with the diagnosis of lepromatous leprosy the treatment was given and patient is doing fine this is another very very common entity that we see in our daily practice which is uh, unilateral acute focal retinochoroiditis the patient was young and had diminution of vision for a week uh, hyperreflectivity on oct and headlight and fog appearance this is a very very common picture treated with intravitreal clindadexa five doses patient uh, is doing very well the lesion was away from macula so the vision is returned to near normal this is the oct showing resolution this is another case where this patient is a young male mild pain with diminution of vision uh, we worked up this case initially we kept our differentials as choroidal granuloma uh, versus posterior scleritis because patient had mild pain and there were some ilm folds present uh, on workup montu turned out to be positive so we uh, although the uh, on on ffa this patient had uh, stippled uh, hyperfluorescence so we did diagnose towards uh, scleritis however the treatment remained the same with steroids and att patient is doing well this is another case of a uh, patient who had diminution of vision for last 2 weeks young male 20 years uh, history of treat, uh, being treated with corticosteroids in the past and pst canacord however uh, this patient had no history of receiving anti tubercular therapy patient was uh, positive for tubercular workup so we started the patient on systemic steroids att and because he had this uh, cnvm we gave the patient anti vegf and this is how the the membrane has contracted towards the disc and uh, vision is returned to normal so the challenges which can present to you are that other specialties in the institute may not be convinced with the systemic cause or association of your diagnosis so you have to liaison with them and convince them documentation is usually a big challenge because of the paucity of online image archiving and viewing systems so equipment procurement is the way to go and uh, the things to keep in mind in a basic setup is frequency and pattern of uveitis must be considered clinical exam with detailed history will clinch a majority of diagnosis and most important is to identify infectious uveitis and avoid steroids straight away cross consult and meticulous record keeping thank you I'd like to invite Dr. Nitin for his talk now.
morning everyone i thank aws and my chief instructor as well as co instructors for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, part of the presentation so uh, this is role of naming and matching in uip space uh, workup as uh, dr samender has already um, emphasized that majority of the diagnosis can be made in made in uits can be made on a good history taking and uh, clinical examination so uh, i will be focusing on this part on the history and examination so as far as naming and matching in uits case uh, workup is concerned why is it is so important because uh, the uits is a entity which is associated with numerous disease associations there can be varied etiologies of the disease it can be infectious non infectious immune mediated and the main uh, uh, thing which comes in the differentials are that Uh, the same similar disease can be uh, uh, similar s s clinical signs and symptoms will be present in almost all the entities also it can have a systemic involvement or it, the disease can be limited to the eye only so the diagnosis is challenging so how um, we are going to solve this problem in uits the important part is differentiating the etiology of uits mainly on the basis of ocular history systemic history and disease codes also is important is the review of symptoms and signs and uh, which are obtained on a detailed ocular examination very important is to classify the intraocular uh, inflammation the classification will help us in reaching the diagnosis in most of the uh, times and also the support from laboratory as well as imaging examinations as sir has previously emphasized so in order to solve a problem we first need to name the problem so in this technique was uh, introduced almost uh, 35 years back by nozick which is naming on the basis of the ocular um, this um, history and uh, examination and first the uh, naming is uh, defining the problem and deriving at a clinical diagnosis and matching is comparing all the entities which have uh, uh, in the patterns are compared which will help us to reaching a provisional diagnosis first and then the final diagnosis so what naming comprises so we have to look at the age gender what is the race severity what is the chronicity of the attacks what is the laterality and what is the pathology and again location of the inflammation is the most important thing so just uh, uh, going through this um, part of the presentation so as soon as the clinic patient walks into the clinic there will be certain things from the history only which will be provide which will be pointing towards a certain diagnosis like in children mostly gra will be the consideration or any parasitic uitis um, in old age mostly the patients can have herpes zoster ophthalmicus and bechet's as well as hla are mostly the diseases of the young similarly in case of females the autoimmune diseases are more common and vkh disease is common also certain diseases are common in uh, certain races like pigmented races will have more of a sarcoid bechet's is common in orientals and caucasians will have uh, ankylosing spondylitis is common similarly in our uh, part of the world socio economic status is very important and uh, certain diseases like leptospirosis rheumatoid granulomas will be common in uh, uh, patients of lower uh, socio economic strata also ocular symptoms which the patient will be telling us may point towards although this is not absolute but they may pro, uh, they may po, uh, point towards a certain diagnosis like pain and redness will be more common in patients with anterior uitis similarly floaters will be common in intermediate uitis and uh, mostly posterior uitis will present with a decreased vision kind of a uh, symptoms so again uh, this part of the um, history is also important what is uh, the chronicity of the disease whether uh, it is limited that is less than 3 months whether it is persistent greater than 3 months whether the disease has been acute which is sudden onset with a limited duration and uh, whether it is recurrent which is uh, the repeated episodes of uitis which are separated by periods of inactivity without treatment uh, and are at least 3 months in duration similarly chronic uitis will be labeled when there is persistent uitis after discontinuation of therapy and then we have to see whether the attacks are mild whether they are moderate or severe also the pathology is very important whether it is non granulomatous or granulomatous 
and coming to etiology we have to differentiate whether these are infectious non infectious traumatic or it is a masquerade type of uveitis anatomic classification plays a very important role in differentiating the various uveitic entities as um, we have to ascertain whether the disease is limited mostly to the anterior part of the eye that is it is having iridocyclitis or anterior cyclitis only intermediate uveitis in the form of a posterior scleritis or a uh, posterior cyclitis or pars planitis and posterior disease in the form of a choroiditis chororetinitis or when all the um, parts of the eye is involved which is a pan uveitis kind of a thing also as uh, these two things are co complementing each other as we are looking at the patient we are ha asking specific history and uh, similarly uh, we are looking for certain signs when we are examining the patient from front to back of the eye we will go in um, and look for the various things what is the findings in the cornea is there any uh, signs of an endothelitis which will mostly provide uh, mostly point towards a viral etiology whether there are any granulomas on the conjunctiva which will be more common in cases of sarcoid or an ophthalmia nodosum similarly we have to look for any iris atrophy which is uh, which points towards diagnosis of a viral uveitis we have to pay attention to the anterior chamber details look for any nodules on the iris surface or uh, in the anterior chamber only similarly whether the vitreitis is focal or diffuse that can also provide uh, clues towards the diagnosis uh similarly retinal involvement whether that is focal which which is seen in sle or bechets and uh, whether the retinitis is diffuse which is seen in case of an acute retinal uh, necrosis so essentially we are dealing with something like this bts group so they all look similar so we have to come to a, a specific uh, diagnosis just like sir had uh, shown a uh, few cases of hyperpion uveitis so i'll be showing these two cases so uh, this is the chart which is we i have borrowed from um, pgi chandigarh so what uh, this is chart which helps in the naming and uh, meshing which is a topic so this was a 30 year old female who had uh, recurrent episodes of uh, inflammation in the anterior chamber in the right eye so a typical uh, this hypopion can be seen and uh, this is the photo which has been taken after the patient was laid to one side so we can see that the hypopion is shifted so some histories we have to take after examining the patient on the slit lamp so um, this was 30 year old female asian indian which was a severe type of uveitis she gave history of recurrent attacks it was unilateral as we can see this was a non granulomatous type of inflammation and there was hypopion and fibrin in the anterior chamber so this is the uh, template which helps us to uh, arriving at a diagnosis so sim at, as we are seeing the patient we are comparing with the known things which can be there in the differential diagnosis that is it endogenous end of thalmitis no there is no such kind of history of any diabetes or previous hospitalization then we will ask about any history of uh, backache so that is also not there so this uh, naming and meshing will help us in uh, reaching the diagnosis in mostly 70 to 80% of the cases and limit our uh, investigations a similar patient uh, with a hypopion uveitis fibrin in the anterior chamber but for this patient he had specific history of uh, backache so a simple hla b27 test and uh, starting the patient on steroids can help us in managing the patient in a positive direction thank you so much for your patient thank you and i think sir is next or next dr safi very good morning so thank you um, to dr samendra for uh, inviting me to this instruction course 
So I'll be talking about how multimodal imaging makes a difference in uveitis. So we've all seen wonderful cases that you can diagnose clinically, but sometimes there are certain cases where you need to go to the extra step. So for example, this is a uh, girl who is a 10 year old, has received multiple uh, courses of oral corticosteroids over several years, and she has potentially all the complications of steroids, such as obesity, Cushingoid syndrome, hypertension, and there is a recurrence of inflammation. Now, unless you have uh, wide field angiography, especially in a pediatric case, it becomes very difficult to assess the pathology. E even if you don't have an optos, you can definitely get peripheral sweeps of fluorescein angiography with your routine camera and assess the amount of inflammation in, in these patients. So children as young as even seven year olds or six year olds can cooperate for a fluorescein and it becomes very important in the management because at this point you can take the decision of starting the patient on immunosuppression and this patient was started on azathioprine. Now similarly, we have seen some wonderful cases of TB, sarcoid from my previous speakers. Now this is a patient of intraocular TB. And if you see, looking at it clinically, you have so many things going on simultaneously. So you have uh, deep choroidal lesions involving the inferior periphery. And you also have a yellowish spot down at the bottom below. Um, this is of course uh, not very clear on optos, but this is an old hemorrhage. And when you realize uh, that there is neovascularization on fluorescein angiography, that's where you can exactly assess the pathology. So there is diffuse vasculitis, you have leakage, you have a cystoid macular edema and neovascularization. So at this point, you know that you have to address more than one issue. And so this patient not only requires uh, anti-TB steroids, but probably even an anti-VEGF to counter the NVE. Again, this is another patient of retinal vasculitis. Uh, and in many cases of retinal vasculitis, you will have peripheral non-perfusion. And this is again easily diagnosed on fluorescein angiography. And you can look at multiple pathologies in one frame. So you can not only look at uh, cystoid macular edema, but also vasculitis and peripheral non-perfusion. And of course, when you investigate the patient, you'll realize that there is a positive MONTU and a CECT. And based on this, uh, you can treat the patient. So you can treat all the involved areas and spare the ones which are not involved. So even if you have some residual neovascularization, it should regress once the inflammation is under control. Now, of course, we apart from TB, we also see several other uh, autoimmune cases of which are which were initially clubbed as white dot, but now we prefer to call them by their individual names. So you have MUDES, MPE, multifocal choroiditis, and serpiginous, and there are others which we don't very much commonly see in India, but definitely in other countries. Uh, such as uh, histoplasmosis, pick, and birdshot. Now, this is a very typical patient that we'll see in our practice. Uh, it was an Asian male. Uh, there is serpiginous choroiditis, and we also depend a lot on autofluorescence imaging to look at the stage of the disease or the activity. So if you look at this image carefully, you'll have a lot of hypo areas which indicate that the disease is inactive in those particular region, but you will have some areas which are hyper, so these areas which are hyper autofluorescent are definitely active. Now the challenge comes when you have a macular choroiditis and you have active lesions which are involving in the, uh, the central part of the macula. And this is where um, I often like to get a, a combined uh, autofl the fluorescein angiography and ICG. So in usually in all white dots, I try to get a combined fluorescein and ICG. And when you have a combined fluorescein, if you notice the macular lesions are not very well appreciated on fluorescein. But on ICG, it becomes very apparent. So when you have a hypofluorescent lesion on ICG, it's definitely uh, you know, an active disease. And when you, if you have OCT and geography with you, you'll realize that the lesion exactly corresponds to the hyporeflectivity on OCT and geo. So you can follow these patients even non-invasively once you have a baseline test. And not only that, OCT and geo tells you that it is definitely a case of choriocapillaritis with inner ischemia which corresponds to ICG. So this was also uh, published in 2017. Now during follow-up, you can do a follow-up ICG uh, or and fluorescein angiography to look at the activity of the disease. Now on fluorescein, when you have this kind of a hyperfluorescence, remember this is just staining. This is not an active leakage. So the, the disease is not active because there is no leakage of the dye, even in the late phase. So of course you also have to look at the ICG you have minimum disturbance of the choreocapillaries in this particular region. 
and that's probably just a residual disease. So this is the comparison of ICG baseline when follow-up and you realize that there is a minimum disturbance on the OCT angiography choriocapillary slab. So it exactly corresponds to your ICG. So the healing of lesions is accompanied by reduction in the flow deficit on OCT angio. So you can use OCT angiography to follow up these lesions periodically. So you can see the resolution. Now this becomes important especially when you want to plan a therapeutic intervention. For example, you want to initiate uh, Im immunosuppression or let's say you are at a point where you want to start tapering immunosuppression. So you can look at these images. And even if you have a placoid chorioretinitis, you can see that on ICG, the moment you have this hypo area, which is the active lesion, you know that the disease is active. And this is exactly the same picture that you get on OCT angiography. So you have a hypo edge. And the moment it's healed, it becomes like this. So you have a mishmash of uh, intervening choriocapillaries and deep choroidal vessels, but th and there is a choriocapillaries atrophy, but the disease does not have an active hypo edge. So it's no longer active. In these placoid chorioretinitis, I have realized that you cannot always depend on autofluorescence. Because if you look at autofluorescence, you will have a lot of hyper areas in the center. And this is often because you have a lot of subretinal fibrosis and you have many other things going on apart from inflammation. So you can not always depend on autofluorescence. And so a repeat ICG in especially placoid cases, or if you have a follow-up OCT angio, it works very well and you can decide uh, your treatment based on this. Now this is something not very commonly seen in India, but you may occasionally come across an MPE. So uh, the difference between MPE and serpiginous or any multifocal choroiditis is that you have the lesion, all the lesions are of the same age. They all come together. There is no biphasic lesion or you don't have one lesion coming today, another lesion coming after one week. And MPE comes all together. And usually the OCT itself is very diagnostic because you have some choriocapillaries ischemia, some thickening of choriocapillaries and diffuse loss of photoreceptors in the center. This is, uh, this is definitely an MPE with ellipsoid zone disruption, photoreceptor disruption and a placoid lesion on ICG. So again, the OCT NGO will show you the same picture. So you have placoid pattern of choriocapillaries deficit, flow deficit and it's a primary choriocapillaritis. Now VKH is a, this is a classic textbook picture and a lot of friends often tell me that I have a unilateral VKH but remember unless you have an ICG you cannot really say if it's a unilateral or a bilateral disease. VKH by definition is a bilateral disease um, and you can see these are textbook uh, picture of like a choroidal granulomas in the stroma and the fluorescein shows you these multiple hyper areas with pooling of the dye. So this is nothing but VKH and in VKH you can have compartmentalization of fluid uh, on the OCT but this is not specific to VKH. You can also find it in MPE and other disorders. So I think I'll just take half a minute. Uh, this is a publication on basilary layer detachment in VKH. I'll not go into details but it essentially means the same thing, the compartmentalization of fluid in uh, VKH. Uh, the last case that I'd like to show you is based on this publication differentiating the TB and sarcoid granuloma. So if you have a very large choroidal granuloma, you can image it using um, OCT and Nitin showed you a case of, uh, choroidal, will show you a case of choroidal granuloma subsequently. But you can see that when you have this outer retinal fuzziness or infiltration with subretinal fluid, then it's definitely going in favor of TB and not sarcoid. On the other hand, if you have well circumscribed choroidal granulomas, without much of subretinal fluid or outer retinal infiltration, it goes in favor of sarcoidosis. Of course, you have to look at systemic uh, investigations like chest CT and other MONTU and other tests. So with this, I think I'd like to end. If there are any questions, we can take it probably at the end. Thank you.
So good morning, everyone. So I would like to thank uh, AIOS and uh, Dr. Samindra for giving me this opportunity. So the topic of my presentation is uh, losing control of your UVATS case, when to decide about a referral and adequate counseling. So I'll be discussing three of the cases uh, in which at one point of time, I thought that I should better refer the patient rather than managing it. So uh, this is a 40 year old Indian male and he presented to me with a sudden onset lo loss of vision since four days in left eye and his vision was low in right eye since childhood. Uh, his vision in right eye was hand movements and uh, in left eye he was counting finger three meters which was improving to 2080. Uh, the pressures were high 36. He had anterior chamber inflammation cells three plus and uh, he had this decentered eye well in left eye. So this is the fundus picture in left eye. There was mit, um, media haze, there was vitritis, there was disc edema. And uh, in periphery, you see this, there are this tongue-shaped yellowish lesion, which were circumferential and in periphery. So the diagnosis is quite obvious. That is, he's suffering from acute retinal necrosis. And uh, it is a clinical diagnosis. So his uh, IgG, though we don't uh, need this test uh, to start the treatment, but his IgG for VZB was positive. So we started him on standard treatment. We admitted him and started on acyclovir, uh, 600 mg three, three times a day and on anti glaucoma medications. And after 48 hours, we started him on Visalon tablet. So this is at presentation day one, vision is 2080. He has this lesion. So, uh, the diagnosis was quite obvious. We started him on acyclovir as we start him. So we expect him to improve. The lesion should stabilize and start healing. So uh, over a period of time, but problem in this case was that over a period of time, his vision progressively deteriorated. There were these new lesions which were appearing. So now in posterior pole, you can see these lesions which were not there before, and they have started reappearing. And in temporal area also, this were the more lesions which were coming up. So on day eight, on a cyclovir, IV, a cyclovir, total eight days we have given, the vision has dropped down to 2600 from 2080 and this new lesions are appearing. Patient is already one night. So at this point of time, I thought that, uh, I think uh, we need to refer the patient. So I discuss him that, see you are one night and we have uh, diagnosed him, you like, uh, you are from acute retinal necrosis. We have given you a standard treatment, but your lesions are not uh, responding. So it's better that you go to a higher center to a senior UVS specialist and get treated. But uh, since patient was poor, uh, he wanted whatever best possible we can do at our institute, we have to do. So uh, in this case, I uh, gave him intravitreal gang cyclovir, uh, three injections. There are few reports that uh, we can treat uh, if there are recalcitrant cases of acute retinal necrosis, we can give them intravitreal gang cyclovir. So this patient received three shots of in intravitreal gang cyclovir and we continued a cyclovir. So over a period of time, this is day 15, vision improved to 20, 320, uh, lesion started resolving. And this is at day 30, vision improved to 21, 25 and the lesions have completely healed. Uh, this is the second case. I think Dr. Samindra is uh, knowing this case. So he is a banker, he is a, a bank manager. He's 43 year old male. And he come he had blurred vision in uh, right eye since six years, and uh, recently had uh, this black spot and distortion of images since three to four months. He was diagnosed as serpiginous like choroiditis. He, when he presented, he was on Visalon 60 mg and azathioprine 50 mg. Uh, he was investigated elsewhere for uh, TB. Montux was negative. So this is the picture at presentation. Right eye had this healed choroiditis lesion. So autofluorescent picture shows complete black. Uh, whereas in left eye, there is this active choroiditis lesion, which is almost reaching or involving the fovea. And in autofluorescent, we can see a lot of white lesions, hyper autofluorescent lesions. So uh, left eye had active choroiditis lesions, almost reaching and involving the fovea. So his weight was uh, around 70 mg. So I, since it was active lesion, so I increased the dose of isolon to 70 mg. And again, the weight was 70. So uh, I plan to give him 2 mg per kg per day as a therapy. So increase the dose to 100 mg and further planning to increase to 150 mg. And I uh, also advise quantiferon gold. Though quantiferon, according to current guidelines, quantiferon gold is not very helpful. Mantux hold more importance as compared to quantiferon gold, but I investigated this uh, accordingly. 
so this is at one week you see that at one week the lesions have started uh, 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 clearing and uh, they are uh, the fuzzy margin are more compact now and uh, this is on autofluorescence but you if you see that the fovea is almost getting involved so uh, another important thing is his quantiferon came of came positive so now i have a banker who has this blurring of vision near provision problem his fovea is almost getting involved and over top of that i am telling that probably you are having tb i have no confirmatory evidence that he has tb so i probably could not convince him for att so at this point of time i thought that i should take a second opinion from a another center unbiased opinion uh, from may maybe senior uva specialist so i referred him to an another center and uh, the other uvit specialist agreed to my plan of point of uh, treatment and uh, he was started on anti tubercular treatment from that center and he further after two weeks he came to me so now lesions are uh, uh, healing more so uh, this patient is under follow up so second point is that whenever you are not able to convince the patient and you strongly suspect some etiology but you don't have a confirmatory evidence it is always better to take a second opinion uh, this is the last case which i wanted to discuss this is case 3 eleven 11 year old boy uh, presented with whitish deposit in left eye uh, since one month this case uh, came to me almost 7 years back so this he had this recurrent episode of redness and blurred vision in left eye since almost one year he consulted hospital a and he was given uh, ciplox d eye drop occasionally for redness uh, one month back he had history of uh, blunt trauma to left eye with cricket ball and he complains of redness watering blurred vision so from uh, hospital a he was referred to hospital b Uh, and hospital B, he was diagnosed as peripheral retinal detachment with secondary glaucoma, severe uveitis, uh, query lenticular matter, and referred to hospital C. In hospital C, he was diagnosed as pan uveitis. Uh, so this was the picture taken at hospital C. He had some media haze and some uh, yellowish lesion uh, uh, deposited inferiorly in the vitreous cavity. So in hospital C, he was uh, he uh, underwent diagnostic PPV. and his aqueous tap and vitreous tap showed plenty of pulse cells pcr for uh, u bacterium genome was positive fungus was negative and there were no atypical or malignant cell uh, other investigations were fine so when he presented he has this whitish fluffy deposit in anterior chamber inferiorly so there were large uh, large cells white cells which were floating in anterior chamber there were few nvis and this was the sclerostomy pore sutured uh, which was done for di diagnostic vitrectomy on fundus examination he had this whitish uh, lesions in periphery uh, this was a mass lesion flat mass lesion in periphery so looking th towards this picture it looks to me like uh, uh, probable retinoblastoma so on investigation ultrasound it did not show any calcification nor did ct scan so how do we proceed further so uh, when he presented this case presented to me i was working in a multi specialty hospital who had a where we i had a good cytology backup so i was planning uh, to take an ac tap and subject the material for cytology but currently where i am working i don't have a good cytology backup so probably if this case have uh, come now so i would have rather referred the patient to a person who had a good cytology backup so that time we did ac tap and uh, it came out to be retinoblastoma subsequently we treated him with uh, chemotherapy and uh, this is uh, following uh, six cycles and we subjected to cryotherapy also and this mass uh, resolved so to summary when should you refer a patient uh, of uveitis so when you think that the disease is progressing you have diagnosed him correctly but patient is not responding patient wanting a second opinion for uh, the disease uh, investigations like pcr or cytology are not available with you and uh, they are important for diagnosing and lastly if we are not comfortable in treating a particular disease entity like in vkh they required lot of long term immunosuppressive therapy and we are not comfortable so it is better to refer the patient and lastly more importantly it is always uh, uh, nice to have a open discussion with patient uh, and relative and they should be they must be informed about the current state uh, status of the disease and about the prognosis uh, thank you for your patient hearing
So Dr. Bhutendu has not uh, made to the conference yet, but I will be presenting uh, his pr uh, presentation. So this is uh, tubercular uveitis, a great masquerader. Living in a uh, highly endemic country uh, with high tuberculosis load, we are always considering tuberculosis uveitis as a um, differential in all the cases, almost all the cases, whether it is anterior or pan uveitis we are considering TB as one of the differentials. So uh, this will be more of a presentation in which we are seeing uh, the various uh, phenotypes of the tubercular uveitis. So uh, as I have highlighted, tuberculosis infection of eyes, it can present with various clinical signs and symptoms, and frequently it can mimic other uh, ophthalmic diseases. The challenges in uh, diagnosing ocular tuberculosis is that it can have varied clinical presentation the quantity of specimens which we get from ocular samples is very uh, um, less and there are certain lack of laboratory investigations which will help us to um, uh, say with extreme confidence that it is tuberculosis. And there is absence of uniformity of the diagnostic criteria uh, for uh, tubercular uveitis. So uh, it can involve any part of the eye, right from the anterior chamber to the uh, posterior chamber in the form of anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, retinal vasculitis, and uh, involvement of the choroid in form of uh, choroiditis or granulomas. And in uh, rare manifestations may involve endophthalmitis, panophthalmitis, is hypopion uh, uveitis or subretinal abscess. So uh, moving on to the this patient. So uh, there are certain signs which can predict whether uh, it is tubercular or not. So as we can see in this patient who had presented with a chronic anterior uveitis, there are multiple nodules uh, and there are broad-based posterior synechy. So uh, this was a paper from PGI in early 2003, which says that uh, if there are more of a post uh, this broad-based posterior synechy, we should consider, uh, this is a phenotypic sign and we should consider that uh, this may be a tubercular kind of a uveitis. In the second patient, we can see uh, Basaka nodules and also uh, these nodules on the iris uh, surface and there are multifocal, these uh, mutton fat KPs, which again point towards the diagnosis of tuberculosis. In cases of acute miliary tuberculosis, there can be a severe anterior uveitis with the yellowish gray nodules all over the iris. And again, in severe cases, there may be presence of a hypopion. Uh, this is one of a rare involvement of the anterior chamber, uh, anterior chamber in which there was raised IOP, solar lens, and uh, this was followed by a scleral abscess. So it can also involve the sclera in uh, some of the cases. So uh, this is one of the patient who presented with a disc edema. There was presence of uh, vitritis. So FFA reveals that there is presence of a hot disc and there is uh, this peripheral vascular leakage. Uh, OCT also helps in the diagnosis as we can document CME. And uh, this is a case of intermediate uveitis. The CT as well as MON2 came out positive for this patient. Again, there can be involvement of the retinal vessels also in tubercular uveitis. In this patient, we can see that there was presence of uh, vitreous cells, one plus. And uh, there was typical, uh, this perivascular uh, involvement of the vessels. In case of tubercular panuveitis, uh, tubercular vasculitis, we can see that there will, there will be more of a involvement of the veins and multiple hemorrhages can be seen in uh, uh, tubercular etiology. Also on FFA, it has been seen that in these kind of patients, there can be extensive new vascularization uh, and uh, non-perfusion of the periphery. Uh, moving on to tubercular choroiditis, um, a recent uh, this Scots is doing a great work in uh, just uh, having uh, to reach certain consensus regarding the diagnosis of tubercular choroiditis also. So they have seen, uh, seen that uh, almost any kind of a posterior kind of uh, involvement can be seen in case of tuberculosis in the form of a SLC, multifocal choroiditis, empigenous, and even MP-like picture can be seen in case of patients with tuberculosis. So this is one of the patient in which two ty different type of phenotypes of tuberculosis can be seen. In uh, one eye, he is having a multifocal choroiditis type of a picture, and in the other eye, there is serpiginous-like of a picture. 
moving on to the um, these multi basilary type of involvement there are two types of diseases in tuber uh, tubercular uveitis either it can be a posse basilary which is the earlier part which has discussed and in the uh, multi basilary type of involvement these granulomas are common so granulomas in case of tuberculosis are uh, having these uh, a typical deep pattern deep involvement they may be involved uh, there there may be some hemorrhages along the borders of these granulomas also in ffa initially we can see that uh, there will be a presence of this hypo pattern along with the um, this hyper along the borders of the lesions in extreme cases in cases of patients who are immunosuppressed or patients who have this uh, kind of a um, uh, disseminated tb subretinal abscesses can also occur this is due to the rapid multiplication of the bacilli and uh, frequent this can be associated with uh, large exudative retinal detachments also as was shown by this paper from uh, south india so one of a few of the rare presentations are neuroretinitis can also occur in the form of a macular scar formation and uh, tubercular optic neuropathy can also occur in these kind of patients again endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis are also very rare presentations of intraocular tuberculosis and uh, in these kinds of patients these will be associated with some uh, kind of a hypopion or a subretinal abscess formation as uh, dr anirudh sir had shown one of the case so um, i will um, these most of the questions have been taken from uh, our mentors at uh, pj chandigarh i thank you for your patient listening to the good morning to all of you i thank aos and dr samantha for giving an opportunity to speak the need for extensive expansive and above elaborate laboratory tests and modern diagnostic assays advances in medicine technology have seen the emergence of many new investigative modalities making it tough for the ophthalmologist to decide whether to test or not to test the new tests do not necessarily mean it is going to be useful on the platter we have various investigation modalities available either could be a skin test serological test imaging test biopsy specimens and pcrs which one to choose so we need to tailor make the investigation for each case and zero on the diagnosis remember all the tests have shared the false positive and false negative we need to understand the sensitivity and specificity of the test for the interpretation diagnostic tests have the most utility in confirming or rejecting the diagnosis that starts with about 50% chance of being correct so when we see a patient suspected infective uveitis or uveitis with atypical presentations we are suspecting more than one infections like multiple infections patients with immunodeficient individuals extremes of age presenting with the masquerade syndrome we need to investigate them in detail polymerase chain reaction is a powerful method to amplify the sequence of dna the minimum volume of 0.05 ml is sufficient enough to make the test so we have nested or real time pcr so depending upon the organisms we order we'll see case example The first case is a 38-year male presented with redness and pain since 14 uh, days, history of backache since one year, history of burning maturation, and no history of fever or skin rashes. Anterior segment examination showed the presence of circumcellular congestions, hypopion, anterior uveitis. So the 
fundus examination was absolutely normal. So Dr. Nitin showed the case of HLA B27 with hypopion. Here we see patient has a non-granulomatous antibiotics with hypopion. On examination, HLA urine showed significant parcels. HLA B27 was negative. This urine culture and sensitivity showed Klebsiella pneumonia infection. We treated the patient with systemic antibiotic, topical steroids and cycloplegic, which resulted in complete resolution of the infection in this patient. It's important, like, you know, hypopion uveitis, we also think HLA B27 are Bechet's, but we need to individualize and investigate the case. This, this particular patient is secondary to UTI. After treating the UTI, the inflammation is completely resolved. The next case is a 51-year male presented with blurring of vision since 12 days. Um, he had headache, photophobia, and significant weight loss. Prior to that, he was hale and healthy. He received Pfizer vaccine, following which he developed pericarditis in November 2021. He had subsequently COVID infections, home isolations, and he was treated with monoclonal antibodies. He had lower abdominal pain with on and off bleed. Colonoscopy was suspect and advised for him. So on examination, visual acuity was normal. He had prominent corneal nerves and AC reaction in both eyes. This is an anterior chamber where you can see the fine pigmentation with the prominent corneal nerves with anterior vitritis and fundus was absolutely normal. The left eye also had fine keratic precipitates. Confocal microscopy showed how like pattern, what we see, which has been described in CMV, anterior uveitis. The specular microscopy showed polymacarthism. Patient has been extensively investigated before the time of presentation. So we did suspect CMV infection. The CMV IgG was positive. We asked the patients to undergo ACTAP for the PCR and everything came negative. We hear the patient has CMV anterior uveitis. The pericarditis was also was supposed to be secondary to and maybe a CMV colitis he had. So based on this, even though the PCR, nested PCR came negative, we started the patient on empirical valgancyclovir along with topical steroids and cycloplegic, following which there is complete resolution of the anterior segment inflammation in this case. We suspect viral uveitis based on the clinical presentation. For CMV anterior uveitis, molecular diagnostic is important to make the diagnosis. Certain can, sometimes the molecular can be negative. The imaging biomarkers indirectly can help us to suspect this. An empirical therapy resulted in resolution of uh, inflammation in this case. The case 3 is a 65-year male, diabetic, hypertensive, he underwent kidney transplant, presented with blurred vision. He was on MMR, Vicelon, and Tacograph, systemic immunosuppressive therapy. On fundus examination, media was clear, where you can see a unifocal retinitis in this case. On close look, we could see a pigmented scar surrounding retinitis. So we made the diagnosis of clinically toxoplasmosis. When we discussed with the nephrologist, what they said post-transplant, People who are on immunosuppressive, viral retinitis is the commonest. They have not seen toxo, so they don't want to believe. They wanted the diagnosis before they start the patient on antitoxo treatment. So OCT also shows full thickness retinal opacification, retinochoroidal lesion. Toxoplasma serological was positive, and PCR from the vitreous is also positive for toxoplasmosis. After seeing the confirmed, then nephrologist had agreed to start the patient on antitoxo treatment following which there is complete resolution of the inflammation in this case. Toxo, we make the diagnosis based on the clinical presentation, but in this case, because of the systemic condition, we need to investigate this patient. The next case is a 31-year male presented with Nairobi. He has been extensively investigated. He was, Mantu was positive and Toxo IgG was positive. Presented like a serpiginous like choroiditis. We all know in our part of country, whenever we see a serpiginous like choroiditis, tuberculosis is in the first differential diagnosis. FFA confirms activity. 
When we did the AC tap, for surprise, the TB came negative, the PCR came positive for B1 gene. So we treated the patient with an antitoxo and systemic steroids resulted in resolution of the inflammation. When we write to the reviewers, they didn't agree. They say the chances of B1 could be false positive. Fortunately, we had the DNA. We did the blast analysis. We confirmed it is secondary to toxo, resulted in response to treatment. So sometimes, like, you know, even though we see, we may have to think out of the box. And if we have molecular diagnostic to confirm, so maybe the first one to report it. SLC, secondary to toxo in this case. Can I continue or she says time up? So the next case is a 65 year male, diabetes. See, this is a case of a HIV CMV retinitis. The patient responded well to intrabitial and systemic gancyclovir therapy. The CD4 was 266. And, but whenever this decrease the interval of the injection, the patient comes back with the recurrences. The patient was taking oral gansoiclu. We were wondering what is the response. Initially, he used to respond. Then the response was not happening. Repeat ACTAP showed positive for the CMB virus by PCR. Then we did the Sanger sequencing, which showed there is an insertion of threonine was observed, which resulted in altered response to gansoiclu therapy in this case. So frequent intravitreal injections resulted in resolving retinitis in this case. Can we conclude? Yes. Yeah, finishing it on time is important. Yes. So abnormal OCT reflectivity is indicates a biomarker for CML. So. I would like to conclude, before we ordering the test, we need to say, will it identify any underlying systemic disease process or association? Will it provide a definitive etiology? Or will it confirm or reject the diagnosis? Or will it help in the management of the patient? If this fulfills one of the criteria, then we go ahead and order. A detailed history and thorough clinical examination is still the most important diagnostic tool for the VIT specialist. Avoid investigations that do not assist finding the cause or in the management. We need to tailor make the investigations according to the clinical picture. Order expensive tests only if the clinical picture so demands or the condition is refractory to treatment. I would like to acknowledge our team members. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Happy to take it up.